So air valve, um, some additional information on air valves. So these, these are, again, you know, widely used, especially in uh, thin-walled pipelines. Usually if you have a, a, a sort of up and down terrain with little local high points, uh, you will have an air valve at those high points anyways just to sort of release uh, accumulated air bubbles in the system. And that's not really, you know, the, the transient effect that we're modeling here. But usually you'll, you'll have them anyways. And what will happen is once the pressure drops below zero, such as from a, a, a emergency pump shutdown event, they open up and they allow air in one orifice. And usually you want to have that air inflow orifice large enough so that that air is able to come in fast enough to keep the water column moving, uh, just similar to how a tank will typically need to, you know, allow that water to flow in at a fast rate to keep the water column moving. But the key is that when you're releasing that air, like if the pressure, you know, as the transient event settles down and you reach your final steady state, sometimes your pressure will return to, to be positive and expel that air. Uh, the thing you want to really be careful of is not to expel that air too quickly, because as I alluded to in the past, if those two adjacent water columns uh, that, that are separated from the air pocket, if those water columns slam together too quickly, they can cause some of the worst transients, uh, usually far worse than the one that you were trying to protect against. Uh, and you'll, you'll see that in a little bit. Uh, so usually you need to size the, the air outflow orifice or, you know, to be smaller than the inflow and such that it, it cushions that, that outflow to not you know, uh, cause that, that air pocket collapse that can be very, uh, very problematic. So this is a triple acting air valve. So with these, you have one air inflow orifice, but when you're releasing that air, there's a mechanism that helps, you know, have that cushioning effect whereby uh, initially it's, it's releasing air quickly through a large size orifice, but right when the water starts to flow up into the air valve, there's a little float in there that will, that will uh, rise up as the water is rising, and that will close up that outflow orifice a little bit. Um, to effectively reduce the outflow orifice size and therefore uh, you know, throttle the air outflow rate and sort of cushion that, that effect of the water columns uh, slamming uh, together. So air valves, um, using them in the model, so again, they, they can really help with local pressures. So if you have one little high point, um, you know, at, at the top of a hill, it, it can certainly help with that, but if it's, uh, you know, maybe a, just a small high point and the terrain is still high, uh, relatively high around it, or sometimes it's just a, you know, a matter of the topology in the land uh, compared to the shape of the wave front as it reaches it. Sometimes the air valve alone doesn't really, uh, doesn't really protect you against those surges and, you know, negative pressures that can occur elsewhere. Um, so that, that's a question I get commonly is, you know, I put in air valves, but, you know, I'm still seeing negative pressure. Why is that? Uh, you really have to animate the profile path and see what's happening as the surge wave is reaching the air valve to really understand uh, what's happening and, and, you know, why in some cases the air valve alone may not be enough to protect against that case. Um, I'm actually going to switch over to Hammer because this, this is a pretty important thing. Um, there's a different model that we have that will show this. So, uh, by the way, in case you didn't know this, uh, within the samples folder under your Hammer installation folder, there's a whole bunch of different sample files. Um, they're included with the installation, and they, most of these I made, um, and these just show an example of a lot of the different types of elements, and there's uh, different scenarios configured as, uh, you know, just to illustrate the use of these different things. Okay, so I think this is a, a fairly good example. I'm just going to take a look at this one here to uh, show you the effect and I'm going to take a look at the profile okay so here you can see this is a, a pump over on the left side an air valve at a high point and if I compute the transient simulation and that's over on my other screen 
what I'll do is animate the profile path and I'll do it pretty slow so you can see what happens. So the pump is shutting down at I think five seconds, oh, four, three seconds. So let me back up. So let's watch as the wave is passing over. You can see this, this, this sort of angle of this wave front as it's traveling to the right. You can see just based on the slope of that, that as it as it hits here, and I'll go a couple of steps further. You can see as it hits that, um, it will sort of first hit this high point here, which is where the air valve is, and that air valve is going to open up and prevent the pressure from dropping lower. But you can see how the the blue line, the minimum pressure, kind of sags around it because it can't protect uh, on the other sides of it. And that's just based on the topology of the land and the other things that are going on. So if I advance to the next time step, you can see just because of the, the angle and the shape of that wave front, as it reached that high point, you know, it was still able to become negative right here. Um, it limited the pressure to zero at the air valve location and, and downstream of it, you can see this, this uh, hydraulic gray, this head kind of continues in a sort of flat, uh, flat manner there and that helps downstream of it, but just because of the topology of the land and the angle of that wave front, it really wasn't able to protect right here. And if we go out a little bit further, you can see just from the way that the waves are reflecting and combining with each other that eventually about right here you can see that this wave you know if I back up a little bit this is almost the opposite it is reaching it, it was basically it's hard to see but it was going from here toward the left side because it had reflected off of this end so as it was traveling to the left side uh, the shape of that wave front was such that it had a, had a dip there so that dip sort of reached the ground elevation before the wave front uh, met the air valve so uh, it's a little hard to describe but it's it's I th I personally think animating these profiles is, is really the best way to uh, see that and I'll, I'll hit the play button here so it's a little more smooth so you can see how the waves are reflecting and get a better you know, understanding of how these negative pressures are still occurring. And then if you extend a little bit later on in the simulation, if you're paying attention to this air volume here, you'll see that once the pressure returns, and this is a double acting air valve, uh, once the pressure returns, right at about 13 seconds, we get an upsurge as a result of the adjacent water column slamming together. And so that's, uh, that's a potential problem there and that propagates down the system, reflects back, and that's another cause for the negative pressure over here. So it's really important to animate your profile pass to get a, you know, a good understanding of why the transient envelope the, you know, between the maximum and minimum is what it is. Um, so a little bit off topic, I guess, there. Um, probably taking a little bit longer than I expected, but I, I think that is an important thing, so I wanted to cover that. Um, another important thing when it comes to air valves, and, and this applies to some of the other elements, but especially with air valves, because usually, as I said, you'll have these just naturally in your profile because of the fact that you may have local high points where you're, you're, you have an air valve there anyways to release just the accumulated air bubbles. Usually those air valves, you may place them directly sort of in line with your main pipeline. So typically in Hammer, you, you're analyzing your, your trunk main, your, you know, usually one linear path, and usually you'll have air valves all along that path. Now the problem is, if you want to look at a scenario where you want to consider what, what will happen if I didn't put the air valves in, then you can't just make those, you can't just delete those air valves because it would uh, delete the pipes next to it and you'd have to draw another pipe and you can't just make the air valves inactive so there's a feature called active topology where you can say this element is is inactive in a certain scenario it's basically ignored it's it's disappeared uh, if you do that then you've, you've broken the pipeline so what you have to do here is set it up with a little you know there's two different methods if you have the air valve in line and you want to have these two different scenarios where you want to check well what happens with the air valve versus without then you would have something either like this where you know the scenario with the air valves will have the main line with the air valve active but a little bypass line around it that's inactive and the scenario where the air valves 
are not in place, like the no protection scenario, the air valve and the adjacent pipes will be inactive, and that's kind of designated by this, this grayish color, but the bypass line will be uh, active. And that bypass line, it's not really a bypass line, it's, it's representing the pipe between these nodes, probably the same diameter, and that way um, you're modeling without the air valve. Uh, the other option is to do it at a T. So this is a little bit easier because you can say, well, in a scenario where the air valves are not there, I just make the air valve and the adjacent pipe inactive. So there's two different ways of entering or describing the, the opening sizes. You can either enter them as orifice diameters, equivalent diameters in inches or millimeters or whatever. Um, but we also have an option to enter an air flow curve. So if you actually have, you know, maybe the size is not an orifice or you have some actual you know data from the manufacturer as far as the the performance uh, for you know airflow rate for certain pressure you can directly enter that uh, as a table in in the program so the key with that method um, that you have to watch out for is that it's a, it's a table of free airflow rate versus pipeline pressure so this gets a little bit complicated because when we're saying pressure that means the pressure inside the pipeline not the pressure of the get you know, of the it trapped air and when we're talking about the air flow rate uh, it's the free air flow rate um, as it's leaving the opening not the the air flow rate of the the air that might be a little bit compressed inside the air valve there's an air valve example model which is really a, a pump shutdown uh, with an air valve and a surge tank um, but just like with the pump and the surge tank element, there's a report period field. And that's another case where that particular element is not included in the extended node data section of the uh, transient results viewer, but rather you have to go to the report, analysis detailed report, wait for it to load, and then scroll all the way to the bottom back up a bit so you can see the top of the results there's the surge tank and here's the air valve so for an air valve we are tracking uh, over time the volume of air inside the air valve the the head the hydraulic grade the mass of air and the air flow rate so let me go down a little bit so you can see as the uh, pump shuts down and the pressure drops to zero, there's a negative flow here, which is basically uh, um, an air inflow. So this is the air outflow rate, I believe. So there's, there's a sign associated with it. So if you're interested to see this type of stuff over time, um, you can pretty easily grab it from here, uh, bring it into a, you know, save it into a separate text file, go into Excel, I think it's in the data tab, you can import from text and set up your column uh, separators. Uh, bring that stuff into Excel and then set up a graph if you wanted to graph it over time. Okay, um, also for air valves, there's an airflow calculation method, so you can choose between defining the, the openings of the air valves as orifices or using an airflow curve. So if you have some information from the air valve manufacturer, you can use airflow curve and uh, there's actually something set up in this um, yeah, here we go. So there's an airflow curve example scenario where I'm using that. So there's a there's a library, and we even have some defaults of uh, free air flow rate versus line pressure. So by free air flow rate, we're referring to basically the the air at um, the air flow rate at atmospheric pressure. So right at the sort of opening to the atmosphere, uh, rather than you know the flow rate of air inside the air valve. Uh, line pressure refers to the pressure in the inside of the pipe, uh, you know, just on the inside of the uh, air valve. And you'll notice there's a library here where you can import from library, and there's several defaults here uh, available to import, but uh, normally you would have this information from uh, an air valve manufacturer. Uh, if you don't, there's always the diameter method, uh, the default method, which is where you specify it as an equivalent uh, circular orifice diameter, and behind the scenes, it, it computes from that the uh, you know the relationship that you would normally have under the air flow curve, which is again 
um, you know, free airflow rate versus line. Pr so at a certain pressure, what is the airflow rate? If you found this video helpful, please give it a like. If you want to see more such series, consider subscribing to our channel. Thank you, and see you next time.